Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. In this series, we are discussing CIC issue number 133, The Priesthood of Every Believer. You can find that at the website CICministry.org. Now we are on this last section of the article. The heading for that is recovering truth, if you're following along on the PDF. But I want to start with, with your opening paragraph here of this section, because this is very important to understand. Now in your article, you say this, though it may seem that the stakes were higher in Luther's day, we would be foolish to think that nothing important is at stake today. Everything is, including the gospel itself. Yes. Now, that is such an important truth, and we can be just as guilty of abdicating this to church authorities as did Catholics at the time of the Reformation. Every group that says that they're Christian should be gospel-preaching churches, and if some church authorities do not want to submit to the authority of Scripture and preach the truth and help people learn and allow people to question whether what they're teaching is from the Bible or not, it's the real gospel, then what you have is a worse problem. Because many people think, well, we had the Reformation, and now we're Protestants, and we have the gospel right, therefore, whatever you hear under the auspices of a church that says it's evangelical or Lutheran or Reformed, whatever it may be, you end up with the same problem. Right. We, we need to be lifelong students of God's word, and we need to be learners, but we also need to take our responsibility to judge doctrine very seriously. And in our churches, we should be able to approach the pastor or the elders and say, okay, I have a, a question about this. You said such and such. How do you explain this from scripture? Or what about this passage? We need to be in a position where we can have those conversations. We can question doctrine and we can have open conversations about things. If, if they're pointing you right back to some, you know, church document or church creed, other than the major Christological creeds, and saying you can't question it, that is a very serious concern. Yeah, and to that end, I was looking at a previous article, uh, CAC issue 95, July, August 2006, because I noticed in the footnotes to the article we're on now, I cited that. Okay. I, I cited Luther there. And... Uh, he prophesied himself. And so in that regard, when we prophesy, we're preaching the gospel and proclaiming the truth that's been revealed once for all. Right. We spent a couple episodes talking about that just recently, but listeners at CIC issue number 95 really goes into a lot more detail than what we can talk about. But now, am I remembering correctly? That's the prophetic calling of every believer. Yes. Yeah. So in that article, you clearly and, and very forthrightly make the case that we all have the ability and the duty to prophesy with, with the understanding that that's not about new revelation. That's about bringing forth valid implications and applications from scripture. Exactly. And every time the gospel is clearly preached, that's prophesying in a sense. Yes. The greatest prophecy. And in that article, I cited someone who's sometimes known for being a cessationist in regard to the gift who prophesies rightly and clearly. So if we define these things, we will end up in a good place. And we still teach the Bible. We still open the scriptures and we look at what God has said, what God has done, and no one's above scrutiny. That's right. And that includes the church authorities. Right. And if we weren't able to have the faith once we're all handed down to the saints, understood in the common vernacular, 
we wouldn't be able to say to the preacher, if there's something that's questionable, can you prove that from scripture? Is that really what that verse says? Right. We need to be able to do that. And they need to have answers. Yes. And so if someone questions something we teach, and we have a class at the church where people do that. If I'm preaching or teaching or teaching in that Sunday school class, people will say, well, wait a second, what about this? So then we you may all prophesy one by one, but let the others judge. Right. And so in that context, is this a good reading and can you defend it? Yes, exactly. And what that does, now some people might think that's uh, out of line to ever question the, the preacher. And we don't interrupt in the middle of a sermon, but we have a place where these things can be discussed publicly. And if we become so thin skinned that well, nobody gets to question me and we silence the church, then we've created the same problem that Luther was dealing with, where the church was silenced by the church authorities. Exactly. And um, you mentioned in your article, and I, I think this is so very important. You say, if we were to abdicate this duty, that is judging doctrine and all the other parts of the priesthood of every believer, if we were to abdicate this duty and decide to let religious authorities do everything for us, we would insult Christ who made us priests. This is our responsibility before God. That's something that uh, we should really think about. And people are more concerned about insulting the pastor than insulting Christ. Wow. That's true. They, wow. <laughs> Sometimes you come up with something that, that really even makes me think, but that's absolutely true. Or they don't want to make waves in their church or what, you know, whatever the reason is, we need to realize that this ultimately is, is how we are honoring God. Well, the greatest gift is a love for the truth. Yes. Those that end up deceived by Antichrist are ones who did not welcome the love of the truth so as to be saved. That's in Thessalonians, I think, 2 Thessalonians. Okay. Welcome there. Decomai means to welcome warmly. Yes. Like people in Luke, the, the unexpected people wanted to hear the truth. The same thing happens in John. And so if someone has a better reading of, of the passage we're talking about, then why wouldn't I want to learn from that? Right. We, we need to do that, and we need to examine the arguments being made. Right, and so I've seen groups that have supposedly Protestant groups, but if anybody questions the leaders or leader, they're out. Right. Well, how's that, how's that not the same error, only maybe not so obvious as this huge system of Roman Catholicism, but yet... By the scripture alone is the authoritative word of God. Now, yes, Rome had creeds and councils and ec, ec cathedra and so on, where the Pope would say something. And we know that's not binding. But the same thing can happen in groups. They get off base and they won't allow themselves to be corrected in any way. That can even often be an issue in churches that we would hold to otherwise be solid. And we've mentioned this before in this series, but you have an article on creedalism, and that's really where we see that come in to otherwise conservative churches. If, if Westminster or the London Baptist Confession or whatever is the final say on anything, we have an issue. Yes, and I wrote about that, and I'm still waiting for somebody to go through that and prove where I am off base because I believe in scripture alone. Right. And the book that I re referenced calls this the creedal imperative, but yet the author admits that the creeds don't agree with each other on very important points. Right. One of the headings in your article is the imperative that isn't. Right. And 
that's really what it boils down to. And we're not saying Westminster doesn't have its place. I I myself will sometimes look up what Westminster or the London Baptist Confession says about different topics. It, it's a tool to use as we are interpreting and understanding scripture, but it's not the final authority on it. Yes, and I still have to continue writing about this, but I've cited Westminster on doctrines like providence that are very well stated. Right. And if someone or some document, certainly the Christological creeds, are explaining things clearly that we can understand, that part is right and commendable. And you don't ensure that no error will ever arise if you force congregants or and or elders, at least the elders, to swear an oath that they're going to uphold a certain creed. Because if there's anything wrong in their massive statement in some cases, it can be corrected. Right. And and that would be the issue we would have with Westminster. And as a new believer, I I think I got them from you. There was a teaching series by John Gerstner going through the Westminster Confession of Faith. And mm -hmm. it was really helpful to me it's as I was trying to get out of really bad doctrine and, and sort some things out. But even then, there were things I didn't disagree with. It was helpful and, and useful in my life, but it wasn't the final authority on doctrine. Well, we sh showed that at one time we uh, in a previous group in the 80s and 90s, early 90s. Yes. We were showing the videos of that and then discussing them. We weren't showing a video and saying, this is the final word. This is what this John Gerstner, who's a well-respected theologian, says. And in some cases, I mean, in many cases, he had some very clear doctrine. But we noticed when it came to things that he has really no good answer for, he'd say yeah. a little bit and go on to something else. Right. And the, the real problem, in my opinion, is neglecting clear teaching that God has a plan for future national Israel. Right. And that Sunday is certainly if they, the Christians can worship, but it's not binding as the only day of worship for Christians. Right, exactly. And so that's what we need to be able to do is to learn from solid sources, but continue to search the scriptures and learn. And even if some very brilliant, erudite uh, theologian comes along and lays it all out, that won't be the final word because the final word is the faith once for all handed down to the saints. Amen. And we're not infallible prophets, but we can search the scriptures. And to that end, I said for years that we need to have the uh, educated church, the members of the church need to be educated, given the tools, given the ability to read the scriptures in the common vernacular, which is was Luther wanted that. Yeah. Well, sadly, the people that will attack the common vernacular claim to be more pious than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, they sure do. Um, and there, so I researched and wrote and refuted the KGV only movement. And then they think I'm a liberal. Exactly. Yeah. You can't win. Well, but the church is what needs to win. The, the beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, if they are taught clearly and they have scriptures in the common vernacular, not meaning dumbed down to say something that it doesn't like the message or yeah. whatever, but different versions. Uh, we need some people to be educated in the original languages, which we've emphasized. And we can give evidence for the reading and not rule everything out and refuse the common vernacular. So even that Reformation doctrine that Luther taught has gone out the window because somebody's translation that most people can't understand is better. Right. And that's false. Yep. And so to that end, 
we really need to be careful that we don't end up in the same problem, only more deceptive in some ways because it's called Protestant. Exactly. Now, in your article, you cite Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Do you want to read that for us? Sure. It says this, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow. Now, it's kind of a doxology mm-hmm. in as far as a literary device, but it's uh, telling us some things that we need to know. And it says that we're a kingdom of priests. Right. And if he has made us priests to God, no church authority should be able to say you can't. You have to go through some other priest because you don't really have access to the high priest, Jesus Christ. Right. And when they do that, they are harming the flock every single time. And frankly, pagan religions have holy men. Yes. And uh, priests and priestesses and shamans and people who claim to hear from God, who claim things that no one should claim. And this includes evangelicals. Right. It includes a lot of people in groups that we would disagree with very strongly, but others come in a nice package. Okay. And maybe a kindly old gentleman who is telling us things that really aren't biblical. Okay. And, uh, or I think one time we did a video where there's Beth Moore. Right. uh, The Be Still DVD. Yeah. She had her own tent of meeting. She can come and get words from God beyond scripture. And we made a DVD about that at one time, a different group I was with. Right. And that's such a good example because here she has this calm, gentle voice, and she's talking about going to the tent of meeting, and it all seems so beautiful and majestic, but it's the opposite of what that passage actually teaches. Right. And then another one we dealt with was this Les Feldig, who who was a nice guy who told us we the teachings of Jesus aren't binding on the church. Right. And that's were, another good example. He seems like this kindly old rancher and just, you know, good old boy who's going to open the word of God. And he seems so nice, but it's false. Right. Because um, John 12, 48 says, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings as one who will judges him. The word I spoke will be his judge, will judge him on the last day. But that doesn't apply to us. That was okay. for this Jewish kingdom that, that would have come to pass had they not rejected it. Right. According to Les Felding, now I've written about that as well. And recently that's been coming back. We're hearing about it again. So, uh, listeners, it's not how nice somebody is, how pretty they are, how demure they are, how winsome they are. It's whether this is biblical. Yes. And the whole counsel of God applies to the whole church. Now, we can understand what covenant we're under, but that's laid out. Okay. So we are loosed from our sins, according to the passage in Revelation, meaning, by the way, the word in the Greek is released. Okay. Well, that's a a huge power to tell people you're still stuck in your sins. You can't get out. Because you didn't do it my way. Wow. And that's what's irrigated to many people, irrigate that to themselves. And then you need the particular teacher to tell you how you get out, and which was what Rome did. And uh, I, I asked in this article that we're looking at, issue 133, can we opt out of this without rejecting the one who paid with his blood? for us to be his priests? And I answer my own rhetorical question, no. Right. It goes with the territory. Okay. If we believe that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is, and he proved it, the pre-existent 
second person of the Trinity, the creator who came into our world, according to John 1, 1 through 18, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, and so forth. And he has spoken and he has given us apostles and prophets that gave us the new covenant, which was predicted in the old, then what he teaches is binding on the church. Right. No lesser priest can give any binding words beyond what's a valid implication and application of scripture. And so in that regard, as we're coming to the end of this article, I have a block quote of what Luther said, and then I want to make an application for us today. Okay. All right. I'll read this quote from Luther. <laughs> and, um, and what you say leading into it, you say, Luther's words ring as true today as when he wrote them. Now here's what Luther said. With what fear and trembling bishops and councils would have spoken and issued decrees if the judgment of hearers would have had to be regarded when decisions were made with respect to priesthood, to the office of teaching, of baptizing, of consecrating, of sacrificing, of binding, of prayer, of judging doctrine. Indeed, there never would have been a universal papacy if this right of judgment had prevailed. They took good counsel when they monopolized this office. Ironically. Yes. <laughs> if you monop monopolize the office of the priesthood of every believer, which we've covered those topics here, then... You can control, as he said elsewhere, the money purses of the whole earth. Right. You can't come to God. You can't have release from sin. You can't have the true word of God. You have to listen to the, the powers that be, whoever they might be. And there are plenty of Protestant cults as well, and groups that really aren't cultic in the sense that they have biblical doctrine, but they act that way when they make their personality something or someone who can't be challenged okay now um i i say this at the end of this article once they took away the priesthood of every believer and made unbiblical priests who functioned in unbiblical ways the gospel itself was laid aside the the need to protest about this is as acute today. That's not what I'm saying. Many are not protesting even though they are called Protestants because it suits their own purposes to keep the flock in the dark about these things. Let's go out of the dark and step into the light of the gospel. That's how I ended this article. Amen. See, God has given us a way out of darkness and into light, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He's given us the truth. He's given us access to the throne of grace. He's given us a mediator. There's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus, who's also God the Son. Okay. Um, I, I printed some verses about that today. Figured we could make good use of it. Yes. And so... If you look at Hebrews 9, 12 through 15, and then Hebrew, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, I just alluded to that. I'll read that, those two. Okay. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony given at the proper time. There's one mediator, and okay. that role has already been by right and by person and by everything that God did is Jesus Christ. Yes. And if we turn to him and trust him, he shed his blood once for all and believe in him and receive the gift of eternal life and those who know him submit to the authority of scripture because those are the words that were given. Yes. Why would we not want that? Why would we want some other Jesus who speaks beyond scripture? 
Right. We need, we need the Jesus of scripture whose words we can know and understand. Yeah, he claimed that his words are life. Yes. And uh, in that, to that end, I'll read several verses here. Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Okay. And in that context, it was dealing with sacrifices going on at the temple. As we know, Rome still has sacrifices going on. Right. It's an affront to God. Yes. But here's what it says in Hebrews. Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That was Hebrews 9, 12. Verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Let's, I want to stop right there. The blood of Jesus isn't just some element in the sacrifice of the mass. Or it's not some words from a holy man. And it isn't just something that gives us a religion. It says here that what God does through the blood of Jesus Christ is cleanse our conscience. Yes. He cleanses us from the inside out. And not only do we have release from sins, as mentioned in Revelation um, 1, 5, and 6, he cleanses our conscience from dead work to serve the living God. We can serve God. We can bring things to him through prayer because he's the mediator. Right. And verse 15 of Hebrews 9 is very pertinent as we're coming to the end of this um, series on the priesthood of every believer. Okay. 915. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death, has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So this inheritance isn't going to go away. It's eternal. And the promise is given to those who believe in Christ. Amen. We are almost out of time. Do you just want to give us a little wrap up of this series? The fact is that it's human nature, if we don't believe the truth and practice the means of grace in the sense of believing the promises, taught the word of God, and so on, if we don't do that, somebody will step into that void and come in and create another priesthood. Exactly. Of something else. And even the pagans do that. They all do. Right. Some people we've known have gotten so disillusioned, disillusioned they just went over to atheism. But okay. there are a lot of atheists, but there's a whole lot of pagan religions. Right. And they're all based on works and generally based on some sort of a holy man or holy woman, priest or priestess, that you follow some prescriptions, you end up being religious. Yes, exactly. But only the blood of Jesus can release us from our sins, cleanse our conscience, and give us the gift of eternal life. And there are promises yet to be fulfilled. And God proved through God the Son, Jesus Christ, when he predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection, and accomplished it, and bodily ascended to heaven, and he's coming back again to bring judgment the reward for those who, who love him and trust him and punishment for those who reject him. That's still true. Yes. And no one is saying, take a leap of blind faith and believe a religion. Okay. Because these things happen in time and space. And so Luther pointed to the fact that this is what the scripture teaches. And we are honored to share these truths with you. You can look these things up. And you're part of the priesthood if you're believing in Jesus Christ. Look it up. Don't just believe it because we said it on a 
podcast or a YouTube video. Right. Okay, we are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this episode and many others, as well as years worth of articles at the website cicministry.org. While you're there, click on contact and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We want to encourage you all to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramis. And Bob DeWay. We'll see you next week.